Yo, do you remember when you could say Star Wars and expect a pleasant conversation? Star Wars, Knights of the Old Republic 2, The Sith Lords, is one of the darkest and deepest games that has been entered into the ocean of Star Wars content. I suspect it's also the most misunderstood. But then again, maybe I'm the crazy one. Maybe I misremember. My perspective on Star Wars in general is narrow. A New Hope is great, and Empire delivers improvements in almost every category. And that seems to be where consensus of justifiable opinions begins to break down. The Unifier is 40 years old. What a tragedy. Those fans that conduct themselves as Death Watch Mandalorians, demanding content of a particular style to match a particular taste, have been easily dismissed with the argument, it's for kids. Well, the same is true of Harry Potter and Adventure Time. Harry Potter grew up with its audience, and Adventure Time weaves candy for the eyes and heart with threads and themes that were more dark and mature than some of Edgar Allan Poe's poetry. These arguments over taste and preference mask a criticism of quality. Any decent plot structure will advance the idea that struggle imbues the climax with significance, and a sharper contrast seems an easy path towards sharper catharsis. Yet, when the climax is revealed, their mere abundance of dark and mature will not hide any shortcomings that proceeded in its construction. When I was a Star Wars foundling, there was nutrition that sustained me in the material. I'll not draw a pistol as quick as the Death Watch, but I'd be a fool to take my helmet off. I think I can get away with saying the waters ahead look navigable, but treacherous. The Mandalorian clans are probably going to be kept scattered, drifting further apart from one another, drawn to their little corners of things crafted just for them and them alone. Maybe this is the way. But we live in new times, and Death Watch aren't known for their poetry, so if you'll permit a metaphor, the old ruins of temples long forgone are hidden, though not yet subsumed by the tide. There really is treasure to fish up waiting in the dark down there, and those of you that would be Jedi will have to enter the cave sooner or later. So before another Ilum is mined hollow, I think we should check one of the most dense, dark, and deep entries in the firmament of Star Wars. Spoilers, by the way. So, where to begin? The Fallacy? The Power? Or the KOTOR 2? They're all a symbiotic circle of ideas, so perhaps I should say that it is possible that every word of the title and every component on the cover of the game might all be lies. Every word, each individual image, in part and composite together, might be a deception. I say might, maybe, and perhaps. That's actually the point of the game, the trick it plays. A player can learn to recognize a fallacy when it appears and still be able to use its power. But that's a waterfall of an idea. Maybe we should start small and merely dip our toes. The original notion that began this project was to unpack the question, what is a powerful Sith? The full title of the game is Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic 2, The Sith Lords. And it's that Sith Lords part that is near to the heart of the questions that the game poses. We can start there. The game KOTOR 2 introduces several overachieving Sith characters, one of whom is nearly always on a list of top ten in power, and another two that are frequent honorable mentions. Darth Nihilus, that guaranteed mention, was a Sith Lord that consumed the life force of entire planets, residents included. His nearest counterpart from the same game, Darth Sion, was a man so angry he could not die. Bro was functionally immortal, indestructible. Including these two on a list of powerful Sith is well-merited. Yet, there is an invisible yet sizable assumption that is required before including them on such a list. Darth Nihilus and Darth Sion are not Sith. A bold claim, I know. 
Now, approximations and components of this notion are scattered here and there along the shore you may have encountered before. I only hope we can lay everything out all at once. I do not hold the arguments that follow to be true in totality. There is a difference between the is of definition, the is of composition, and the is of predication. Which is to say, the arguments are true, from a certain point of view. Now, what the criff am I talking about? You're right. I said we'd ease into things. You know I want to share something about Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic 2 with you. But, for now, let's simply fish up a definition for Sith. We'll be skipping over the long extinct species native to Cordoban, as ethnography is rarely interesting on its own. The most obvious place to start, then, is the Sith Code. A quick recitation goes, Peace is a lie. There is only passion. Through passion, I gain strength. Through strength, I gain power. And through power, I gain victory. Through victory, my chains are broken. The Force will set me free. The local nature of my chains and me free will have importance built upon them later, if you can carry those in the back of your mind for now. But as it stands, this creed outrightly states that passion is the only fuel which an adherent should draw upon. Passion. So anyone that adheres to this explicitly might rightly be called Sith. But so too might anyone who uses the Force to fulfill want in any meaningful way. I do some interpretation to say the most basic decision-making process of I do want this, I don't want that, to which all action is subordinated, could be argued as either manifesting or guiding one's passions. Manifesting or guiding passions. To clarify, we maybe have two definitions in just the Sith Code. Those that use a kind of fuel, and those that have an opinion on how things should be. Maybe Darth Sion and Darth Nihilus both use a kind of fuel. And maybe they both have an opinion on how the galaxy should be. Maybe. We'll circle back, as we've got two more pearls to examine. So, I've got the boxes with the 2003 Gendi Clone Wars in the other room. And I still vividly remember Dooku egoing Ventress. Quote, You are not Sith. You wear the trappings of the Sith, you fight like the Sith, but this can be imitated, however. You lack one vital quality, found in all Sith. Sith have no fear, and I sense much fear in you. We could take this statement at face value as a serviceable definition, but why should we? Deconstruction alone leads us to where we must ask. Is it the no-fear quality on its own? In some kind of combination with the fighting and aesthetic signaling? In context of an adherent to the code, maybe? And if fearlessness really were a necessary quality, then an entire category of passion, the want of not to be afraid, would be removed from the power sources available for this interpretation of a Sith to draw upon. And before we go deeper, let's look to another fictional world. A quick reference outside of Star Wars over to Nolan's Dark Knight Rises. The film argues underneath its narrative that the fear of death is a powerful emotional tool with physiological effects that are ready and harnessable for use, either good or ill. But back to the Dooku quote, and in particular, its context in-universe. Such is the power dynamic in the rule of two, that it is most unwise to lower your skepticism. At least when the writing is good. The line is a tilt, obviously. But it has more than one use. It simultaneously is meant to trigger, while it, more importantly, reinforces a sense of separation that, most immediately, needs to be overcome with a show of actions. It's a type of separation that's a key ingredient for a perpetual never-good-enough kind of servitude as a dark-side acolyte, and never a Sith. 
by such means is the rule of two preserved with some notable debate. The internal effects of such a dynamic can lead to effort being spent on hiding a show of fear or even rebuking one's own self for being afraid, thereby wasting mental energy battling one's own self. The phrase covertly weaponizes the instinct to self-improvement, a mind trick without the force. Duku be toxic like that. Now, as for Darth Nihilus and Darth Sion, it's hard to say if they were capable of fear as we would understand it. But their very presence did indeed have a poisoning effect, both more subtle and more obvious than Duku's. Their ethos dominated those around them, Nihilus inducing a sense of helplessness, while Sion seemed to demand a single-mindedness. But the effect was primal. If Dooku's style could be likened to the 48 laws of power, then Nihilus and Sion have doubled down on the most savage laws and ignored everything about decorum, tact, and regal conduct. So maybe Sith are supposed to have an air of being in charge at every interaction. But can that include the primal? Or must it be dignified only? Does culture and social circumstance have a say? If so, then circumstance would control some of the power, wouldn't it? It's hard to say. Let's try another definition. Now, the third definition. And, as you know, the third thing in any sequence so constructed is either a resolution or an escalation. So enters Darth Virelock III. I didn't dig the comic back up, so correct specificity if you must. To my memory, the quote goes, A Sith imposes his will upon the living force. Now, this quote precedes Varlock literally mind-melting the ghost of a god-king from the ancient days of the Sith. It's a whole other project to discuss the shift in philosophy from the order of the Sith Lords and their poisoning of the Commonwealth to the Rule of Two, where I think it's misleadingly said, poison is concentrated into one cup. It might be better described that all the holes in the dam are sealed off, save for two. Two outlets for the dark side, two for whom the water pressure will remain high and increase exponentially as the dark side boils to be used. Then, from the rule of two, there is the transitioning into the Order of the One Sith, where everyone, Warhammer style, must pour some of their own water into the common well under a single dominion before being allowed to draw from that well in a self-reinforcing kind of gaming of the dark side. As another aside, I'll argue we saw a similar kind of gaming on Zakur without the implicit adherence to one aspect of the Force. But neither here nor there. So, now, even with this crude and admittedly suspect knowledge of the evolution of theology and practice that has all been called Sith, at which Virelock sits at a place of significance at the well-controlled well at the end, he still does not furnish a definition that excludes his forebears. It is a definition in keeping with the many interpretations of the Sith Code. A Sith imposes their will upon the living force. This is the definition we've been noodling and spearfishing for. It's simple, describes something viscerally accurate, and straddles a tremendous theological rift underneath its semantics. Now, before we swim out into the deep, let's switch rivers again. And for real, mildly unpleasant interruptions to escapism await. Plug your nose and hold your breath for 30. You'll be fine. In the digital space, there are techniques of bot swarming and sock puppeting, wherein individual neckbeards or state-funded actors will direct scores of empty accounts to orbit various topics or other accounts to build the idea of consensus. Keep that in mind in general, but also as we shift IP again. The Shining, the film at least, I don't know about the book or the miniseries. 
But do you remember how all those people just started appearing to the characters? They could have been ghosts, trapped in a cycle, or visions of the past and future locked in cyclical suffering. Yet they were all fairly consistently trying to get Jack and Danny to stay and play with them. Invitational. There was nothing much discernibly distinct in their intentions, like hollowed out finger puppets all a part of the same hand of something that was holding the Torrance family in its palm. There's that eastern fable of the Buddha holding the monkey king in his hand whilst letting the monkey think he's free to go as he pleases, teaching the monkey a lesson about perception, both about self and the world. Perhaps in The Shining, instead of the Buddha, it's King Yama holding the monkey. Regardless of how plausible this interpretation might be compared to others, it's a yawning kind of spooky that changes some things. If your head is still above water, it should be clear where this current of thought deposits us on the question of Nihilus and Scion. The will they express is not their own. They are conduits for aspects of the dark side. Hunger and scorn. That's an important perspective on its own, but it remains open to challenge as a matter of point of view. Very well. Context is one pathway to meaning, so hang on. Rapids ahead. Of course, I've seen a fair amount of clips of George himself laying out the tenets for all Star Wars. The Sith have obsessions. The Jedi are selfless. The will of the Force is all around us. All fair enough, but there's a great deal more to be explored in just the simple pillars. Campbell's Hero's Journey, the Tao and the Brahman, Apollonianism versus Dionysianism, Nietzsche against the Gnostics. The list of real disciplines of thought that can be found beneath the surface in non-exclusive ways is fathomless. The ambiguity is a gift. And with all these valid enough influences and undercurrents in the original trilogy, we all saw what we needed to see of Luke's training as he began to grasp the Force. His training was to let go of conscious self, which we are shown to be synonymous with the Jedi as selfless. And we saw the Sith refuse to let go, becoming the Hort Kazed, consumed by their own death grip. Nihilus and Scion are a mockery of this arrangement. They have let go, but not in the way that Luke did. They exemplify the idea that the dark side of the Force is, at least in part, transactional. They corrode the description of a benevolent, all-binding good will of the Force. They are a warning that all advice that prescribes is not universal. There are no axioms, as I think their master might say. To let go the conscious self and act on instinct can make monsters. Where the Sith Code has been said to be an affirmation of life by use of the Force, as a direct criticism of the Jedi Code's apparent denial of life for the sake of the Force, we see in KOTOR 2 both religions warped so easily to yield the opposite result. If it is fair to say the dark side is transactional, these two traded away life so that they could continue to exist. And if the dark side of the Force has a will of its own, then it gained tools in them. The Sith's focus of self, the worship of the me and the my at the end of the Sith Code, was the only shield against this kind of unlife we see manifest through Nihilus and Scion. Identity disappearing into such power. From this certain point of view, they are not Sith, as they have no will of their own that they could impose. I hope that makes sense. I hope that makes sense because it's important. Interpretations of Sith are, more often than not, built atop one of two pillars. Commentators often begin with a judgment of Sith actions, starting there likely as a shock value hook, 
and then work backwards to imply a model of Sithness with a value set that supports the actions. Or, interpretations begin with stated values, against which actions are then measured for commitment. I propose a third pillar, not superseding or overshadowing, but adjacent and underused. I think I already mentioned it back there somewhere in the tide of words already. Sith have actionable opinions about the way the universe should be. It's more than actions alone. The idea undermines the notion that we are all only that which we do. But nor does it affirm we are what we wish. No value is built in mere preference to an imagined or incorporeal ideal. And the first time I thought this essay was done, I found related ideas readily pre-existing in the belly of Balthazar and in Aristotle's poetics. Aristotle sees fit to mention action, character, and thought. Admittedly, his arrangement is slightly different as he speaks to a different purpose. But as we speak of it here, thought, when mastered, climbs this pillar I erect and poorly name a pillar of self and actionable opinion. Without this perspective, we can see action as only outcomes, and character as only qualities plus temperament. Yet the want to act in the world is inseparably wed to that which is acted in the world. These two create a single idea which is often so unrightly split apart. It's from atop this pillar of actionable opinion that I argue Nihilus and Scion are not Sith, though the other pillars most certainly still support them. And it is from this pillar that a great many characters that would be Jedi are undermined by the draw of this perspective. If this interpretation is to be taken seriously, Luke was only truly a Jedi for brief moments in time, when he turned off his targeted computer on the trench run, when he let go of the banister on Cloud City, and when he threw down his lightsaber on the second Death Star. The rest of Luke's life that we are shown, his actions were guided by a firm opinion of right and wrong. Opinions which he acted upon, which led him into moments of violent contest. Right and wrong, as quick, easy, and seductive points of view. I quote, It is difficult to follow the Jedi Code when so few others have. And it is here where the other contender for Sith Lord might be suitably addressed. Not the Master, not yet. Rather, the noble Jedi librarian, corrupted by her books and her wants. The scholar that gets right and wrong, not deconstructed, but rather twisted. The woman in white from the cover. Now what more noble want could there be than to resist the Sith and see the Jedi Order survive? How right is the instinct to preserve lessons from the past to bring benefit for those yet to come? What actions would be justifiable for the future, or for the ideals? For those that don't know, in KOTOR 2, the Jedi are scattered. The academy's destroyed. All of the galaxy limps on, bleeding and wounded from long wars. The Republic is nearly vanquished in its victory. The Jedi religion, as always, had been at the heart of each of the conflicts. The Jedi go without friends, while the Sith build armies of spies and assassins, weaponizing hope. A disturbing feeling Cold War grips the galaxy, and Nihilus and Sion hunt Jedi, quietly stalking and striking from dark space. The Librarian understands the stakes. She has knowledge of the reality and knows how far away her want for a better future is. If nothing is done, the ideals will be destroyed and replaced. So, she studies. She studies pragmatism and efficiency. She studies until she becomes the knowledge she studies. Outcomes fall away as process matters more and more, 
and quietly, she becomes a prisoner to the pathway she built in her own mind. All that would oppose her are Sith, as she can only afford to deal in expedient absolutes. This Jedi Council woman climbs the pillar of actionable opinion, higher than perhaps even her rivals Darth Nihilus and Darth Sion. But perhaps she's chained to it. She's rarely even a footnote on those lists of honorable mentions. Forgettable and quiet in legacy, like so many other stepping stones cast off in Sith rivalries. With these three, it begins to seem as though talent, discipline, and intellect are not sufficient, nor is stoicism or selflessness. This interpretation of actionable opinion as Sith sinks all definitions of Jedi that do not adhere to the strictest way of no way. But wherever philosophers would quote the wisdom of Lao Tzu, there will come retorts and needles supplied by those philosophers who know their Zhanzu, someone who can make a mockery of things. So, from this height, we can begin to see the shadow of Kreia far below. But we've only begun to address the question of power and fallacy. So, from this height, we can take the plunge, as it was from this height that the councilwoman was nudged into the deep end. Nudged, of course, by Kreia. Kreia, by her own words, claims that she is but a mirror. If accurate, then she cannot be understood without understanding all that surrounds her. So, it's here where I think we find the obligation to discuss the Force, all its aspects, not just the narrow and dogmatic view of every individual contributor to the franchise and its commentary. Now there is a host of material in the Golden Age and elsewhere that leans too far fantasy or too far sci-fi for my tastes, but for the dark side considerations there's technomancers, alchemists, and deities all scattered across the range of genre fiction. But for the variety, many through lines remain. We all know most interpretations of the magic system of the Force sees the use of classically negative emotions as correlated to deformity and decay. Whilst the light side might preserve and tranquilize, the dark side seeks to be active and effect a change. A change as simple as doing damage, even in the user. The structure of Sith belief systems all too often facilitates a spiraling paranoia, arguably another aspect of the dark side seeking expression. The callous and opulent malevolence of Palpatine is arguably another such form. And as a thought, perhaps a master telling their apprentice that it should taste like poison lets the apprentice mistake the harm they bring into themselves for power thus keeping them weak. But the Force is benevolent, it heals, gives life, and unifies, anyone could say. The dark side does not have a will, it does not seek to transact, as I argue. Well, that belief implies that people are evil, not the Force. Maybe. If that's true, it might be why so many of the light side acolytes call for a deconstruction of one's own ego. If that's true, the dark side must be a consequence of evil within a mind. It is then individual minds that corrupt the force around them. They are either a polluting sieve or something corrupting spills from them, leaving a stain like oil in the sea. But is this true of the Councilwoman? By the end, she is a Jedi, only in her own mind. The Light Side's inoculating call to stillness and surety turned into a poison. A dangerous case study in mass formation. Perhaps this is the power of Darth Nihilus and Darth Sion. Even trying to address them as an intellectual problem poisons one's own self. 
This councilwoman from the cover art does seem so outmatched. She does much to demonstrate the problem of study. We tread into those waters parallel of critical theory, where it could be said that ideas seek minds as vessels, tolpa seeking expression for those more vulnerable to such beliefs. And for everyone else, this is Foucault's power knowledge or Guy de Boer's mediating spectacle. This character should underscore the notion that any one particular perspective of critique seems to be able to use truth claims to smuggle value propositions. Truth claims as the light of the anglerfish, that any type of sordid criticism, when touched by utilitarianism, intentionally or otherwise, brings a corrosion into itself. The truth remains for a time, but it does erode the foundations of anything built atop it in search of value. And so, the ivory tower is made into a fortress of ignorance. And fortresses always retain their usefulness, as long as their foundations are not washed away in a storm. And when times become tumultuous, rivals will call for the destruction of study altogether, whilst devotees see only Sith gathering at the gates. But what this means in Star Wars, what this character suggests, is that the Force may be fickle. The title of Jedi is so obviously false upon her shoulders in the end, but it's a trap to ask what the title means in the first place. The game does not force the issue, but it does let the player go deeper to ask from where do titles derive meaning at all. For as committed to the legacy of the Jedi as this person was, the only thing required to turn them to the dark side was time at study. Perhaps she did not let go. Perhaps her opinion of how the galaxy should be arranged overshadowed the will of the Force. Or perhaps the Force does not seek balance as a static state. The light side's rebirth and renewal may require a terrible flood to come before, and there may be seasons where such tragedies belong. A season of growth and a season of storm, guided by the hand of the Force, light or dark. It's here, with this understanding, that Kreia begins her work. With words alone, she traps all three of those figures from the cover. The councilwoman is rendered ignorant inside a withering fortress. The indestructible, undrownable man is chained in the bottom of the sea in a place of her choosing. And Nihilus, he who would drink all the ocean, must go where she directs swallowing the cup of concentrated poison she leaves for him. And is the player free from her manipulations? Of course not. The deep things could not reach her as she understands both them and the sea they swim better than they understand themselves. Kreia, or Darth Treya. She is one of those occasional, honorable mentions on those lists of powerful Sith. But what was her power? Words? They are indeed a means to meaning, but this seems to pale in comparison to the raw power in her former students. And her students knew it. The very moniker of Darth Treya says everything it needs to say. False teachings can be a pathway to truth, but only if one is not wounded so gravely as to be rendered blind. Thus, every student is a failure before her tutelage begins. To trust the will of the Force, or to trust the Force as your weapon, to trust a master or an ideal, is to betray yourself. Is that idea powerful? Is that idea Sith? Does Darth Treya belong on the list of honorable Sith mentions? To proceed from here, Safely, let's look at an example from the game. Not the famous one from Nar Shaddaa, 
but rather with the shaman and force healer, Jodo Chabat. So, the quick facts. Jodo Chabat and his Ithorian herd are responsible for a restoration project trying to save a planet. The project is fraught with political and, consequently, funding trouble. Kreia does not approve of aiding him. And it is here where I have heard claimed that Kreia projects a brutal, self-interested utilitarianism on others. It's been argued she projects the worst on others because she is, at her core, Sith. A grandmotherly styling of Dooku's sovereign Sith. It's a very useful explanation. But its usefulness has limits. The writer of this game exists in a context where we have access to more than just Nietzsche as an influence. So too could there be echoes of Jameson and Jung and all the other post-Marxist thinkers wherein there is an overt question about the nature of unconscious paradigms, of culture, and of the various modes of production. Critically, mode is not the same as means. In Star Wars, the very mode of only Jedi and only Sith is challenged by the existence of Chodo Chabat as a shaman and force healer in the tradition of his people, the Athorians. They have four throats, and still the species seems to struggle to form the sounds of a lie. Those poor criffing nerf herders. It is possible Kreia projects ill intent on his request for aid and subsequently is greatly involving the player character in the restoration project. But that would mean Kreia is unable to see altruism. As an alternative, it is possible that her warnings of entanglement are about Chodo's unconscious intentions. He seeks to restore a world and thus the force around it, recreating the old modes of thinking that the Force seems to bring with it. A mode of light side and dark side only, in a self-amplifying feedback loop. Or, perhaps she is cautious against allying with someone with an incomplete understanding of game theory. Someone so committed to a positive sum game, which is to make more than there was before that they are unable to recognize when the moment shifts into zero sum. Such shifts bring with them wildly different strategies for success. A young man with money meets an old man with experience. When they part ways, the old man has the money, and the young man has experience. Chodo Chabat and his authorians are vulnerable in many ways, but are rendered most vulnerable because he does not know the parable to be true. He and his Athorian herd prove more than vulnerable. They are in fact helpless against more practiced zero-sum participants around them. It could have been predicted that they would need more help than they initially asked for, and they give, in exchange, only the minor boon that was offered from the start along with a sincere recommittal promise that they will save a world which could not save itself. Perhaps Chodo's overly ambitious promise of charity could be said to undermine self-determination by trusting the will of the Force. Perhaps, too, in his petitions for aid, he displaces responsibility away from himself. Perhaps Kreia's disapproval comes from more than one place in this instance. Nearly every instance with Kreia could be said to be worthy of similar examination. Where she goes and why. Where she does not go. For if she is Sith, why does she not set foot on the philosophy's homeworld of Korriban? Does the question have a single answer? And why does she respond to some dialogue options as though the player character is asking thoughtless questions. And on Nar Shadda, it might be enough to say you will need the contrast, as she foreshadows that to which she will forever be an adversary. And on the subject of adversary, 
covertly important to the question of Darth Treya's identity as Sith is the fact that she does not take up the namesake until the end. Was she Sith when she saved the Exile and the Gambler from Darth Sion? Was she Sith at Malachor V when everyone else was defeated? And in which moment was she more herself? Nietzscheism seems close, but when Nietzsche says God is dead, it means something different than when Darth Treyup finally declares her intentions. Her analysis so effortlessly topples the romantic notions that the Jedi are benevolent rulers and protectors, just as it drains meaning in the belief of the heroic, self-made Sith Lord. She rejects the notion that the Force is simply the bountiful ocean that provides for all peoples gathered on their little islands within its arms just as she rejects the idea that the Force is best used as the highway for warlords to raid island after island, leaving stains in their wake. The Force must also be the uncaring Stormbringer that wipes islands clean season after season. The Force is the ultimate master of fate that sings siren songs of serenity and power both. The ocean itself is the nemesis. As the climax approaches in KOTOR 2, Kreia reveals herself as Darth Treya, but perhaps it could be said she assumes the role of Darth Treya, the necessary antagonist the player must confront. In that final showdown, she wears the trappings of the Sith, and she fights like the Sith. For the Sith have always sought confrontation with Jedi, and then sought confrontation with one another. Regardless of what the player has chosen to be, Kreia forces a final fight as one last test. She could not present herself as anything else but Sith to fulfill the ending she had built. Kreia attacks from every angle. Every layer of the nervous system must be mastered, and every layer of belief is put to the test. From the nature of the world, to the essence of value and morality, down even to self-identity. The choice is to grow stronger and survive, and to unify the pieces of what is truly yourself to triumph. To show you mercy, or speak clearly, would be to steal a kind of purity. The player will be Kreia's triumph as a teacher, or the player will be proof that the depths of her ideals cannot be taught. Hegel's recognition will be sourced in the bondsman or in the self. She will bring forth Nietzsche's Ubermensch, or she will be the Ubermensch. You are astute. You have heard me say the player character, and you have heard me say the player. You've swam with me this far. You've seen the tools at work without being told what they are. And, a long, long time ago, I said that everything on the cover of this game was a lie. I need your attention now, more than before, to show you the tools deliberately. The title of this game is Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic II, The Sith Lords. Of Star Wars, there is no conflict rising to the galactic stage as there is in the rest of the franchise. The insidious squeezing Cold War manifests at its most explosive moments only as brief planetary sorties of Knights of the Old Republic. There is only one. A patriotic mobster, a shadowy persona dedicated to criminality as the best means to stabilize the very concept of law and order. And as for the Jedi, those former Knights of the Old Republic, those guardians of peace and justice, they are, at best, and I quote, Cowards, doubters, and afraid. 
Each of them that you find are still recognizable as Jedi Masters, but are trapped in the past, dabbling in hypocrisy, or are consumed by helplessness, making the titles feel hollow. And for the Old Republic itself, it's absent and nebulous, like a single parent working the night shift, communicating only through texts and notes on the fridge. Even the demarcation of the Roman numeral 2 is a trick. Inescapably, it is the second game of 2. Inescapably, the player will have encountered other Star Wars media, and that will have shaped ideas about the way things should be. With a bit of stretching, this symbol for the number 2 could even invoke the ideas of duality that are at the foundations of Star Wars. But there's a space in between. The further down the Star Wars path a fan has come only means there's a longer road to navigate back down if a wrong turn was taken somewhere. The more that has been learned, the more that may need to be unlearned. And the phrase, the Sith Lords, I find the plural little letter S to be exceedingly clever. You'll have to decide for yourself how many Sith Lords you see on the cover. This game secretly challenges the player to unlearn what they have learned. But so well constructed is the difficulty of this challenge that those same tools can be put to hardening what has already been built. I suspect we are in a protracted season now where there is a draw towards realistic fiction to make things gritty and dark. We seek to see things we recognize as real reflected safely behind a barrier of fiction. But fiction can have the power to reach back from the deep, like KOTOR 2 does. But perhaps KOTOR 2 is not Star Wars from a certain point of view. It wields lightsabers and starships like the Star Wars, it incorporates the Force like the Star Wars, but this can be imitated, however. KOTOR 2 lacks one vital quality found in all Star Wars. Star Wars offers resolution, and I see only ambiguity in the void. Underneath the mask, Belying all that Star Wars paraphernalia, there are ideas within this game that are easily missed. Games, a genre of fiction that, as always, has taught the wrong lesson. That the veil of fiction separates us from consequence to act freely. That fiction itself is a barrier. The idea, then, of acting freely of self-expression is best found as something contained on the other side of the barrier of fiction. A deception easy to believe because some of the borders are defined. It teaches that things cannot spill out and in without notice. But when are we more ourselves? I steal a certain type of strength from you now as I make the final lesson clear that Kreia hid from you at the very end. From the moment the game began, it has deceived you. There is no great revelation, there is no great secret. There is only you. You are that which might change your own perspective. The power of Kreia lies in these tools of critical inquiry. The first principles, always, ab initio. What is each thing in itself? Where is its beginning and its end? How can each thing be touched? Will finds a way and forsakes the rest. For as deep as the ocean of Star Wars goes, it threatens to drag souls to the abyss as Sir Alec Guinness or Alan Moore feared. But the journey can be a circle. KOTOR 2 does not merely go deep. Its fiction spills over. That might be my favorite quality that fiction can possess. It allows us to anoint ourselves in knowledge from the cups that we prefer. Star Wars has gotten out of hand. 
we must respect that it has exceeded any one interpretation. And yet, it remains the height of arrogance to see that truth as carte blanche. I caution the Death Watch to not ignite the quality criticism casually, as KOTOR 2 is an entry into Star Wars where something primordial, something that extends beyond the boundaries of fiction, has found a way to don the mask of Star Wars. Such things are rarely coerced. Let's head back to shore. Was Darth Treya Sith? Does that do Kreia justice? Was she powerful? Well, she fought all the ocean alone and might have succeeded were it not for one of her students. Were any enemies in the game truly Sith? Does it matter? Of course it does. Such titles allow us to break the galaxy down into light and dark to categorize it. Sith and Jedi will always be recognizable, and the utility of the categories are undeniable. But the categories are not immutable. The skill to both understand the utility and to change the category when it is suitable is the lesson KOTOR 2 will teach you, or hide from you. Or maybe I'm the fool. Maybe I drink too deeply from the stream. Maybe it's all a mirage. Maybe there's nothing in the cave but what I brought with me. I would not recommend every Star Wars entry swim out as far or as deep as KOTOR 2 seems to do. Likewise, it would be foolish to demand someone change their taste and appetite to match one's own. After all, validation, certitude, does a Jedi crave these things? Maybe I'm not a Star Wars fan, but for those of you that resonate with the image of the Jedi, you'll have to make your own way into the cave at some point. And for those hardened shells with withering hearts, just remember the Cortosis Fist takes hold of little. A generous sense of humor is better than Beskar. So what's to come for the Star Wars fandom? Well, there's less and less value in lamenting more elegant films from a more civilized age, and there's especially no real fun in blasting people about clumsy or random entries. So what then can we say for the franchise overall? Perhaps I'm too old, but Sir Alec Guinness seems to keep his air of wisdom. If those core films aren't bringing us together, where is their value? If KOTOR 2 doesn't bring us together either, where is its value? Should we expect better? Not from you idle fishermen, but from those great liners on the horizon, hauling nets to pull everything of value up to the surface. The old man leaves with the money. I hear Andor is good, but how fraught are the waters? And the first Fallen Order, likewise, is of a different type. Little to unpack and beautiful for it, but I still suspect we'll not see creatures of the deep like KOTOR 2 for some time. Such is the season that we'll likely not come together at the same table to feast upon the next catch. We'll only get the gutted, cleaned, and pre-packaged individual fillets of leviathans that have come before. It is difficult to follow the Jedi Code when so few others have. There is no blame. All must accept. All right, back to dry land again. Hope you fished up something valuable. The game is super buggy on Steam, but F4, F5 seems to work, and I'm not expecting the reboot to be finished anytime soon, or ever for that matter, as I suspect coming echoes in the Force will overshadow any value that can be mined from a dusty old game. As for labors of love, I cannot speak to the restored content mods, but yes, without them, the base game does just kind of end. Much is missing from a narrative perspective, which would taste of hypocrisy if it did not feel like a real-life tragedy. No explanations and no closure. Simply an ending. 
And so, we arrive at the end of this conversation. I take my helmet off to say this. I choose to believe in your success, Exile. Steal what wisdom you can from however you play the grand game. Let none of the fractured clans be an obstacle. Only opportunities to you. This is the way. I think I've captured the spirit of the game well enough. I'm going to go play Edge of the Empire with my wife. Go think about something fun, touch grass, get some sunshine, look into upping your vitamin D game in general. Grow your free will for the better. After you fight, lament, and describe, the Force will be with you. Always. <laughs>